Coming up on this episode, before you buy, Russell's reviewing a really fancy Canon camera, Shannon's reviewing a wireless keyboard, Leo's reviewing the iPad mini, and I'm reviewing a little bit of this monitor that you see to my right here. That's all coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Before You Buy is brought to you by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, go to Stamps.com now. Click on the microphone and enter Before You Buy. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. Plus, more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code before you buy 11. Hey everyone, welcome to Before You Buy, it's Twit product review show starring Leo Laporte and everyone on Twit, Leo Laporte and friends and colleagues. I am not Leo Laporte, I'm Sarah Lane, I'm filling in for him this week when he's on vacation, but it's going to be a great show, we've got a lot of products to get through, so let's get right into it. Our IT wizard himself, Russell Tammany, has reviewed the Canon 1DX. Russell, what do you think? Hi, this is Russell Tammany for Before You Buy, and today I'll be reviewing the Canon 1DX digital SLR. Now, this is Canon's top-of-the-line DSLR. Uh, they've replaced the 1DS and the regular 1D lineup with the 1DX. So this is basically the best Canon digital SLR on the market today. Now, it has an 18 megapixel full-frame sensor with a native ISO of 51,200, uh, which is quite high. You can push it up to 204,800, but uh, you know, the quality at that level is really not usable. So for all intents and purposes, it's 51,200 ISO. Um, it has a 61-point autofocus, so this camera is intended for sports, tracking. Uh, it's 12 frames a second. Uh, that's the main feature of it, is that you get twice the frames per second of the 5D Mark III. So it's really important when you're shooting something like sports that you actually get the image, where the boxer connects the punch or you know, the exact image that you want in an accident, in a car race. So getting twice the number of pictures over the 5D Mark III is really the key feature of this camera. Now, uh, you get a lot of features here. Uh, there's a lot of ports and options on this camera. Uh, it has a microphone in uh, with manual audio levels. Uh, you, have, you still have the old connector for the shutter release. One thing that I've really wanted Canon to do forever is to add a in-camera intervalometer so that you didn't have to purchase an expensive external controller to shoot time-lapse. Uh, sadly, that's still not in Canon's top-of-the-line cameras, while it's pretty much in every Nikon DSLR. Uh, you also have a PC sync port. Uh, something new in the 1DX is you have an Ethernet port. This Ethernet port can be used for tethered shooting and remote control of the camera. Uh, the Wi-Fi option is also available, and it plugs into uh, the port that's right next to it. So you basically have the choice of either Wi-Fi or Ethernet, but it's nice that the Ethernet is built in because most of the time that you're doing a tethered shoot, it's in a studio, and it's really more reliable to work with Ethernet than Wi-Fi on a tethered shoot anyway. Uh, you also have a micro, uh, actually it's not micro, it's a mini HDMI, uh, as well as a regular uh, mini USB. So the mini USB can also be used for tethered shooting, uh, I've tested it with a DSLR controller on Android, and you can plug an Android phone with USB host directly into it, control shooting and focus, and basically use it like you would with Lightroom. Uh, so you've also got a couple of new features on the back side of the camera. So one of the important things that they've done is they've added this multi-controller, which allows you to directly select focus points to the vertical grip. Uh, one thing you can do with the 5D Mark III and other cameras is purchase a battery grip, which gives you the vertical shutter, uh, as well as some other controls for when you're shooting uh, in portrait mode, uh, which is generally what you're going to be doing if you're shooting people, is you're going to be using portrait mode quite a bit. 
So uh, the previous camera that I had, which is the 1D Mark III, was missing the multi-controller. So it was very awkward to be using the camera in portrait mode, but every time you wanted to change the focus up to someone's eyes, have to reach over on the back and change the focus point on that controller. So you now have every single control, except for the quick button, which uh, isn't really used for shooting, uh, available to you in the vertical grip option. Uh, it maintains all of Canon's regular 1D style uh, dual LCD, where you can select uh, which card you're writing to, and also uh, you can tell whether you've got a GPS or a network connection, what folder you're in, what file number you're on, as well as the regular top LCD, which shows you the ISO and uh, mode and uh, exposure, shooting modes, all that kind of stuff that's regularly on the top of the screen uh, is still there. Uh, and then uh, because this camera records at 12 frames a second or 14 in JPEG when it's not doing autofocus, uh, it requires very, very fast memory. Uh, it can also do 1080p, 30 frames a second, uh, all intraframe codec video, which is very high bit rate. So because of that, this camera drops the SD cards that used to be in the Mark III and Mark IV. So you, what you get is you get dual compact flash, but it's UDMA 7 support. So it'll do about 100 megabytes a second. And in this camera, this is one of the only cameras on the market that it's actually worth paying for a UDMA 7 card, like Lexar's 1000X series. Uh, most other cameras, you're you know, fine with a UDMA 5 or 6 card because you're not going to get any extra performance out of it. But uh, I've tested this with my older SanDisk Extreme cards, uh, and this new Lexar card uh, clears the buffer much quicker. So this camera feels great to operate. It's very, very responsive and fast. And at the 12 frames a second, that's how long you can shoot in RAW to the compact flash before you start to hit the buffer. So it's somewhere around 48, 49 shots, which is really amazing. The other amazing thing is that with those fast cards, you can just set up. You can just set up and do it again. So you have a couple seconds between uh, what you're shooting, and you can go right back. And you're basically never waiting on the buffer. So this camera is extremely, extremely performance oriented and is really amazing. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that the viewfinder blackout time has been reduced quite a bit. So when you're using higher shutter speeds and you take a picture, you barely see the viewfinder blink out at all. It's so quick that you don't notice it go to black. It just sort of flickers a little bit. So overall, this is an excellent camera. Uh, the pros are that it's full frame, 18 megapixels, very clean at high ISOs, uh, looks excellent at lower ISOs. It's very sharp uh, and a fast camera to shoot on. It tracks autofocus and has a very long uh, amount of shots before you actually hit a buffer at that high 12 frames a second. Uh, I really can't say enough good things about this camera, um, but the cons are that the price is $6,799, and that's for the body only. Uh, that's a rather expensive camera. It's more expensive than the previous uh, regular 1D Mark III and IV were when they came out. However, it's cheaper than the 1DS, which used to be the only full frame uh, camera. Uh, that Canon made that you know was slower. So essentially you've got a 1DS that now shoots 12 frames a second and has a great autofocus system. So you know Canon is sort of justified in where they've priced this camera. Um, I do have a couple of other complaints like that GPS wasn't built in. You have to purchase a separate GPS unit, plug it into where the Wi-Fi connector plugs into. Um, this just sort of gets in the way and it's a little slower than a, having the GPS built in. Um, it also doesn't have a headphone jack, which would be great for video, uh, to be able to monitor your actual recording. It's something that you know, we do with video cameras, and Canon has not decided to put that on a rather expensive pro DSLR. Uh, the intervalometer being missing, um, and just the actual size and weight of it. You know, this is not the easiest thing to travel with. It's also very noticeable when you're walking around with it. Um, so you're not going to blend in as a tourist. Uh, people are going to come up to you and ask you about your camera and what you're shooting and look at what you're shooting, uh, which is rather distracting. Um, the basic summary is that while this camera is really outstanding, the 5D Mark III, which is about $3,000 less, 
is a very, very close competitor to this camera. Uh, Canon, for the first time, has put in the same autofocus system, however, not the same metering and tracking system, uh, into the 5D3. Uh, it is also six frames a second. Uh, it's a little higher megapixels and a little bit higher noise, but it is an outstanding camera. So I'm still going to give this Canon 1DX a buy, even though it is a lot more expensive than a 5D Mark III. If you're looking at a 1 Series professional camera, uh, I feel that it's a better choice than Nikon's D4, uh, and I feel that it's a fantastic camera. Uh, so I give it a buy uh, with a but of that you really should be buying the 5D Mark III unless there's a very good reason for you to upgrade to the 1DX. This is Russell Tammany for Before You Buy, reviewing the Canon 1DX. Thank you, Russell. I now have Shannon Moore's producer of Before You Buy. Hi. Hi, Shannon. How's it going? It's very well. New employee of Twit. Yes, Everybody's thank so you. glad to have you. You've got the 1DX. Yeah, don't um, tell anybody. And I'm noticing you're Russell sort of double room. palming it because it's heavy. It's like four pounds. It's really, really heavy. Yeah. In fact, I think I, 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 I said something cat. like, oh, I think this is seven pounds. And someone said, no, it's only about four and a half. But wow. it's heavier it than It feels like cat. a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he mentioned in his review how when you take pictures, yeah, they go so fast you can't even see the, the shutter move. Yeah. Try I mean, it out. Listen, this is a beautiful, beautiful camera. Um, and... I think that it's it's priced pretty much all of us out of even. Oh yeah, you know, which breathing is why on I locked it. Russell in the back room, and I'm going to take it home. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, Russell's got a uh, a lens on here. He said it was another about eighteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you're, this this entire package is the sort of thing where if I'm on a vacation, I don't even want anybody to see me holding this because they Definitely will take not. my head off yeah. and steal it. Uh, it's beautiful. It's um. If you're a pro, and especially if you're really concerned with action photography, photojournalistic oh, yeah, stuff, this would be perfect where it's super fast shutter speed and a lot of storage all at once, makes a lot of sense. Yes. But for the average consumer, I just prefer to drool. Definitely go for Not the 5D on it, if of you're an average consumer. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, you have another review coming up. I do, yeah. I'm reviewing the Logitech keyboard that I'm checking out this week. All right, cool. Well, we'll get to that in just a second, but uh, first we're going to take a little break, and to help us through the break with... With, with strength and, and, and speed is Leo Laporte. Hey, before you buyers, can I tell you about the best deal you'll ever get? Stamps.com. I know if you go to the post office, you know, it could sometimes be a, a little bit of um, a time sink. Wouldn't it be nice if you could print postage whenever you need it? Well, you can anytime. Postage on demand. Uh, and no, you don't need a postage meter. In fact, uh, this is going to save you like... 80% of the cost of a postage meter. It's stamps.com. And you've already got everything you need to use stamps.com. You got a computer? Check. You got you got a printer? Check. You're ready to use stamps.com. Go to stamps.com right now and try it out. You got a 30-day trial waiting for you at stamps.com. I'll tell you all the details in a second. But first, let me tell you why we use stamps.com. We, you know, we do a lot of mailing. And, of course, one of the things you want to do is you always have the right amount of postage on everything you mail. You always need postage. You don't want to have to send somebody to wait in line at the post office. You really want to have what you need right here, right now. We looked at postage meters. Very expensive. You even have to pay special ink costs. That's ridiculous. Um, Stamps.com solves that whole problem. With Stamps.com, you've got a USB scale, so you plop the letter or the picture or the you know the envelope the package whatever it is you're mailing you plop it on the scale you always know exactly how much postage you need uh, it'll print the postage you can either print a mailing label or and i love this stamps.com will even print right on the envelope your logo your return address even the address ease address because stamps.com works with your quickbooks your paypal your amazon etsy uh, ebay whatever you you know you use it will work with it take the address book and print that all out it's so ever so cool. I really like stamps.com. If you're doing international mailing, same thing, and they'll even uh, print out the forms you need with stamps.com. And stamps.com is like an advanced mailing system, too, because you can uh, set up notifications automatically if you're sending priority mail or express mail. A click of the mouse means that an email will go out to your correspondent saying the package went out. Of course, the mail carrier comes and gets the packages. You can even schedule free pickups whenever you want. I can go on and on, but really, you've got to try it. No hidden fees, no long-term contracts, no extra hardware, discounts you can't get the, at the post office, and just the convenience of it. Here's the deal. Visit Stamps.com right now. And uh, before you do anything else, you, no, I know you see that $80 offer, but don't use that. Before you do anything else, click the microphone 
at the top of the page in the top right there and use our offer code, one word, before you buy. One word, before you buy. When you type that in, it goes to a $110 bonus offer. You get to use up to $55 in free postage. You get the scale. You, you get the, the supply kit and a month of Stamps.com. I want you to try it right now. Stamps.com. Remember, though, use our offer code before you buy. And now we take you back to before you buy. Well, thanks, Leo. So, Shannon, I told everybody that you had a review. And now that you're just sitting here right across <laughs> from me, we got something in the middle here. What is it? So this is my own personal Logitech K400R wireless touch keyboard. All right. And I use this personally for my home theater PC at home with my Windows 7 laptop connected to my television on my couch while I'm chilling out and have nothing better to do than watch Hulu at night. <laughs> Now, the trackpad over here on the right, yes. I assume that's something that takes a little bit of getting used to? Yeah, it does. So this is the mouse trackpad over here. Uh, one thing I do want to mention about this trackpad is since it's not flush with the rest of the keyboard here, it doesn't work that well with Windows 8, especially if you're trying to push in the charms bar or push in the, uh, the slide view over on the other side. It kind of messes up a bit. So you might notice that you have some issues with Windows 8, but with Windows 7, it works really well. Um, the keyboard itself is nice. It's a full keyboard, and it's very uh, flush, so it's not going to, you know, you're not going to pop out the keys or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I noticed about the keys is it's hard to actually pop them out. I don't even know if they do pop out. So if you have to clean it, it might be kind of tough to do so. So don't spill anything on this because it might be hard to clean. Um, it has all these cool function keys up here, too. I love these keys. So... Instead of having to use the mouse to go over on your laptop and turn down the volume controls, another thing you can do is press the function keys right here, which work really, really fluidly and really well. And we also have keys on the other side, like this left, left click right here, so you can drop and drag. So you don't have to necessarily use the mouse on the other side for that. You could use two thumbs. So, for example, if I wanted to, I could hold down right here and move the mouse to move around windows. Isn't oh, that cool. cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's, 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 it's wireless. You obviously, mm -hmm. you know, might want to be able to put it on your lap and yes. it'd be somewhat comfortable. Is it light? Yes, it's very light. It's, it's less than a pound. I would say maybe five ounces or something around there. And you can sit it on your lap. It's really comfy and you can just click away. Mm -hmm. And the keys are really soft. So while you're watching a movie or something like that and you want to type on it, maybe, maybe you write your novella. Write and your not novella. Bother. You're not going to bother to anybody by typing on it because it's so soft. You can barely hear it whenever I click on the keys. Uh, it does have an on and off button on the back right here. I did notice one day, uh, for some reason, it wasn't registering when I had my laptop on. And I was like, what in the world is going on? Turns out, oh, yeah, the button was the wrong way. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of messed up there. But hey, it was all right. And also, it takes two double A's. So that's one downfall for this one is because it takes two double A's, it does have to be re, you have to put in new batteries now and then. It's not rechargeable. I would prefer if it was rechargeable mm -hmm. myself, but at $30 for the price tag, you really can't go so wrong with that. And last but not least, it also uses the unifying receiver and it has this nice little place inside this tab for you to stick it in so you won't go, won't lose it if you have to travel with the keyboard itself. So you just use the unifying receiver like any other Logitech uh, wireless device, mm -hmm. and it can work with up to six different Logitech devices in the same laptop. Just plug it in and you're ready to go. No download needed of the software on this, which is also very cool. So my pros and cons for this. First of all, the pros, of course, it is very comfortable to use. It's lovely, and it's a $30 price tag, price tag which is great. Mm -hmm. And the cons. It does look kind of cheap. It feels kind of cheap, like if you knock on it. It, sure. yeah, it feels like it kind of bend around a little bit. And it takes two AA batteries. I would really, really prefer if it was rechargeable. So where are we looking on the buy? Or it's the a buy. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I love this thing. It is my favorite device. I use it every single night. I haven't had to switch out the batteries yet, and I've used it for about a month, every, almost every night. So, so yeah, it's a very good device. It's handy, and at $30, you really can't go wrong with it. All right. Well, we got a buy from Shannon Morse on the Logitech wireless keyboard. Model number? 
K400R. <laughs> Good memory. Good memory. It's like, what is that again? <laughs> you should see what I'm reviewing later. There's no way you can memorize the model number on that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Now we've got a very special review, something that many of you are probably wondering about. What did Leo think about his brand new iPad mini? He's going to tell you. Hi, I'm Leo Laporte with a review of the latest iPad, the iPad mini from Apple. Now, I got the Wi-Fi version, so it just came in. Uh, they come in black and white and in a couple of different memory configurations, 16, 32, and 64 gigabytes. This is a Wi-Fi black, as you can see, 32 gigabyte. I'm actually glad I didn't get the smallest size because I've loaded this up not just with apps, but also books and movies and TV shows for my plane flight uh, to Australia. This is going to be, I decided, my, my device of choice for traveling, and mostly because of the size. Here's a standard iPad. This is the third generation iPad. And, and the Mini, is, it actually fits into the screen of the original iPad with room left over. It's about as wide as a screen and maybe a half inch shorter. Uh, that gives you some idea of the difference. Um, instead of being 9.7 inches, the iPad mini is 7.9 inches. There are some other sacrifices, too. Uh, it is a slower processor, uh, more like an iPad 2. Battery life's about the same, uh, but the biggest loss, frankly, is the screen. I don't really understand why Apple didn't make the iPad mini a retina display. It isn't. It's 1024 by 768. I guess that's probably how they kept the price a little bit low, but... If you're used to a retina display, as I am with my iPad, you're going to notice the jaggy uh, uh, text when you read and, and when you look closely uh, on games and things. Um, having said that, uh, you know, because it's uh, only 1025 by 768, 1024 by 768, it's snappy, it's fast. You don't notice the lack of processor speed by any means. And I'm really seeing this as a content consumption device more than a content creation device. It's just small enough that you probably don't want to type on the keyboard uh, a whole heck of a lot. Um, you know, it's just a little bit a little bit too small to easily uh, use. Uh, of course, if you have a standalone keyboard, it's going to be designed for the width of the iPad, not the mini, and it's going to look a little bit funky. A Bluetooth keyboard would probably look all right. But I, again, I, I think this is, I'm seeing this more as a, a kind of almost a Kindle um, where it's good for reading, for watching videos, for participating in social networks, um, and for taking pictures. And that's one thing that the iPad mini has that I'm pleased about. One of the reasons it might be a better choice for you than a Kindle Nexus 7. The Nexus 7 is roughly the same size. It's 16 by 9 instead of the 4 by 3 aspect ratio that the iPad mini is. The Nexus 7 also is a higher resolution, higher dots per inch, but it doesn't have a rear-facing camera. So if taking pictures is something that you want to do uh, with your uh, mini tablet, then the iPad mini is probably a better choice than the Nexus 7. Having said that, uh, the iPad mini is a lot more expensive. Google just dropped the price on the Nexus 7, and you're spending about 130 bucks more uh, to get an iOS device and a rear-facing camera. So pros and cons on the iPad mini, well, I do like the size. In fact, I, I prefer the size of the iPad mini to the traditional iPad. It's a lot lighter, uh, it's thinner, and it's just easier to hold in the hand. I won't have any trouble reading in bed with this, for instance. It's more like a Kindle in that respect. The screen does look great. I mean, it's, it's great color. Uh, it's very responsive. It, it, you know, it feels good. And I, and I kind of like the black back and the bezel. This looks more like the design of the iPhone 5 than it does uh, of the more traditional mini. Cons, not a retina display. And they only put a 5 megapixel camera in here, not the 8 megapixel you would get on the iPhone uh, 5. Uh, price is a mixed bag. You know, it's a lot less than an iPad. It's the least expensive uh, iPad, $329 for 16 gigabytes, 100 bucks more to add another 16 gigs and another 100 bucks to get up to 64 gigs. Um, but that's a little pricey, 429 for this 32 gig uh, iPad mini when 499 get me a 16 gig regular iPad with a retina display. And, of course, when you compare it to the Kindle uh, HD Fire, which is 200 bucks, or the Nexus 7, which is 200 bucks, it really doesn't seem like a very good deal at all. It seems a little bit pricey. Here's what I wish. I wish Apple had said, 
Fine, we'll put the faster processor in. We'll put a retina display in. Maybe even put a better camera in. Charge more for it. But tell people, look, it's everything that the iPad fourth generation is. It's just a little bit more compact. That would have made me happier. Apple kind of compromised. They didn't get it as inexpensive as the competitors, uh, and they didn't get it as powerful as their big iPad mini. So try, buy, don't buy. I have to say, I'm going to give this a don't buy. I'm very happy I have it. I, I actually love it, and I'm going to carry it. But I just have a feeling that Apple, maybe even in a few months, will release a Retina version of the iPad mini. And uh, many people will say, gee, I, I wish I had that instead. So I've got to say, lack of a Retina display means don't buy. I know that I am one of the few that everybody's going to run out and get them, and frankly, I'm kind of glad I have it. It's really great for gaming and and uh, watching movies and video and so forth. It, it's just uh, it, it's cute. By the way, you can't hold it in a single hand. It's just it, that's a stretch. That's like a yoga. That's like a yoga pose. <laughs> Buy it only if you're willing to uh, grit your teeth when Apple comes up with an upgraded Retina version of the iPad Mini next year. For before you buy, I'm Leo Laporte. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Leo. He doesn't like it. Yeah, I'm kind of well, surprised. He likes it. Buy. He says, I love it, but you shouldn't buy it. But you shouldn't buy it. Right. Well, I can understand that. With the price point, there are a lot of other options out there that people will probably go for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think the price is, is a real stickler. Um, I know for me, the lack of retina display, just because I have the, well, it's the third gen iPad, which mm -hmm. is previously known as the new iPad. Now it's the old new iPad. It is retina. I love it. Yeah. My iPhone is also Retina. So now to have the third piece, I'm still waiting on my LTE uh, iPad mini because it hasn't shipped yet. It's going to be a little strange. I yeah. think I'm probably not going to want to have everything, go back and forth between everything. Oh, I'm sure that would be kind of awkward seeing the difference between sure. Retina right there in front of your face. Then again, I've got people saying the, the, the screen is small enough so that it's really not a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. I'll have to know, you know, with my own with my own trial and error and the apps that I use most regularly, yeah. does it matter if it's not Retina, if the screen is a little bit smaller? Yeah, I'm a little contemplative on this one. I, I think I need to actually go to the Apple store or check out yours when it comes in later this month. Well, I hope it comes this month. I <laughs> don't have a shipping date yet, and sometimes I fear I'll never get one. But uh, but yes, once I get it, I'll bring it to work, and we can all we can all take our notes it. from there. Great. <laughs> all right, I've still I've still got my own review on the show. I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna review a, a new model. Uh, but before, we want to take a moment to thank Squarespace. They're our second sponsor of this episode of Before You Buy. And what's great about Squarespace is they have a new content management system all built into Squarespace 6. It's the new Squarespace. It is awesome. I mean, it's, it's faster and easier than it's ever been to create a website, a blog, an online portfolio that makes you look like a pro. It is high quality. Squarespace has always been known for this, but the new Squarespace is better than ever. Part of that reason is a really good mobile experience. Uh, it used to be that, you know, you make a beautiful website and everything looks great, and then somebody uh, goes to your website from one of these devices and it's stretched or it's weird or the, the images don't show up properly. Squarespace now makes seven different versions of any image you add to your site so that the correct size loads for a device. So it's not only snappy, but it actually works. That's what a professional site is supposed to do. New Squarespace also has really good social media integration. I know that's important to me, probably important to you too. Are you on Twitter 24 seven? Well, your site should reflect that. It should be easy to link back and forth between the two. Uh, if you if you post something, a new post on your Squarespace blog, you're really excited about it, you should be able to auto post to other social networks like Twitter. You take an Instagram photo, wouldn't it be nice if it was it was in the upper right hand corner, let's say, with a link back to the permalink. Instagram's on the web now, for goodness sakes, of course. So Squarespace has thought of all of that. They've got integrations with Dropbox, with LinkedIn, with Foursquare, with StumbleUpon. The list goes on. All the big names in social media are represented with Squarespace, and it's so easy to add widgets to your site. Squarespace templates, uh, they have a, 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 a plethora. <laughs> I was trying to find the right word to describe how many templates there are just to start from. They're really beautiful, and they're really varied. You can choose something, and it's never going to look anything like anything else's, uh, anybody else's website online. And once you've got your blog up and running, you're really happy with it, 
you can make sure that you have a really good idea of who's visiting, stats, uh, behind the scenes, overview of, of your traffic each day and who's commenting and where they're coming from and, and all that information that helps you make the best website possible is at your fingertips. And I can say, because I've got a Squarespace blog and I, I've run into little questions here and there, that their customer support is top notch. They've always been extremely responsive and able to answer my questions really easy. So here's what you do. We want you to try a free trial. Uh, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. It's very easy to do. You don't need a credit card at hand or anything like that. You just just try it out. Then if, if you decide to purchase uh, an annual plan or even a monthly plan, just use the offer code before you buy 11. So that's all one word, before you buy 11, and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of an annual uh, uh, or monthly plan. Don't forget, Squarespace is kind of a one-stop shop, right? So if you buy an annual plan, you also have free domain registration. So if you're going to go for a year, you might as well get that domain registration bundled in. That's squarespace.com and try it out. When you're ready to buy, figure out what plan is right for you and use that offer code before you buy 11 for 10% off. And we thank Squarespace so much for sponsoring this episode of Before You Buy. All right, Shannon, I mentioned that I had to refer to my notes to get the model number for this beautiful monitor. You've been looking at it throughout the show wondering, <laughs> what is it? Well, this is actually what I'm reviewing. This is the ViewSonic VX2370S MH LED monitor, or you could think of it as <laughs> oh the gosh. 1080p IPS monitor. Uh, this is a, this is a, th first of all, let's talk about the price because it's $258. Uh, there are a few models of this ViewSonic monitor that are out. This is one of the nicer ones. I think they start, you know, in the, in the high 100s, still very affordable. It's an LED monitor, 1080p. Um, it's 1920 by 1080. Of course, this is just a monitor, so it depends on what you're using as your source material. But if the material is pretty nice to start off with, as we can see here on the monitor, it looks pretty good. ViewSonic says that they've got a frameless bezel here. Now, when we were plugging it's it in close. for the first time, without the, with, without the image, we were like, wow, there, it really is almost no uh, frame at all. Now, of course... Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course, once you get an image up, it sort of, again, depends on what your source computer is. We've got, mm -hmm. we've got a little bit of a framing issue on, on sort of the left, right, and the top, not really yeah, on the we bottom. Had a bit of an issue with the laptop getting it to scale up correctly because it didn't have the correct resolution to match up with the monitor. Exactly. But, you know, that happens. That happens. And it, again, it, it depends on what you're using uh, this monitor with, right? So there, there's, some, uh, there's some potential issues here, but for the most part, it looks really nice. Um, Let's see if I can turn it this way a little bit just to show you how thin it is. It's very thin. Hey, man. Hey, new iMac. You got nothing on this. Actually, I think the <laughs> iMac's a little bit thinner. But in general, it's about the same footprint, right? You've got a nice thin monitor here. You've got, you, you've got your, uh, you know, you sort of your angled foot. What happened when I first took it out of the box is I had the monitor and the, this, uh, the, the, the vertical part, but not actually the bottom part of my stand connected. And I thought, oh my God, am I really going to, is this like an Ikea thing? I got to put this thing together. <laughs> it was actually extremely easy. It took me 30 seconds. You kind of just lay it down and, and screw and, and the parts are all there. So not a problem. Um, in the back, if you're wondering what connects to this guy, um, you know, we've got our power AC adapter. We've got HDMI in, we've got VGA, we have DVI. Um, the VGA and the HDMI cables come bundled in. Uh, the uh, the DVI does not. Um, then you've got a speaker and, and microphone out, and it comes with one audio cable. What's kind of cool about this guy is that there's also built-in stereo speakers here. Um, kind of hard to see. I assure you they're there. They don't sound awesome. So they're there, but they don't sound awesome. But certainly, I mean, if, you, if, if this is something that would be like an external monitor on a laptop, it certainly could rival laptop speakers, depending on the laptop that you're using. And of course, if you're looking for, well, where's your, you know, your onboard settings? These, uh, there's some little numbers, thank you. This is also where the, where the power button is. Shannon and I, it took us a little while to find that because it's cleverly hidden. Once you know it's there, it's not a big deal, uh, but it is a little bit hidden. Um, so, okay, so what's, what are our thoughts? Um, the pros, I think, are, uh, the price, the price is very attractive. 
Um, $260, that's that's very doable. It's nice and thin. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty... I don't know. It's pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 picture looks pretty nice. I think the cons are, it's not that heavy, and that's because it's a little bit flimsy feeling. You know, you kind of get. I think Shannon, maybe some of the same feeling that you were getting with your wireless keyboard is. Yes. It's nice and light, but it's not that substantial. We've got some plasticky feelings might here. Might be a little dangerous to have a cat around it. <laughs> it's not very <laughs> cat friendly. Um, I see this. Let's see what else. Um, and. It's it, you know it might be nice to have more than one HDMI input. Mm -hmm. That's something that I I use on my monitor at home. So right away I think, oh gosh, I'd have to get creative with this. So if it's something that you would be downgrading, if you've got something you'd be downgrading from, I don't really know why you'd want this unless it would just be for some sort of a extra monitor, a dual monitor kind of a setup. Uh, besides that, I think it is a nice monitor. I would never tell somebody to buy a monitor that's not just right for them. So I think I'm gonna go with a solid try for this. If this is what you're looking for, that's not a, it's not a blow your socks off type monitor, but the image looks pretty nice and you can certainly put it on a desk, uh, almost flush up against the, uh, the wall and it's not gonna take up a lot of space and it looks pretty good. Then I say, ViewSonic, give it a try. And that's my review. Yeah, I gotta agree agree with you. Um, this is definitely better than the monitors that I have at home on my gaming PC. Mm -hmm. um, so I could definitely see myself upgrading to this, especially since it's so cheap. Two hundred and sixty dollars, you said? Wow. Yeah. That's a great price, isn't it? Yeah, I could totally game on this. You could game on this. You have, again, second monitor. If you've got a little bit of room on your desk, or for whatever reason you need another one, and it's just not the right time for you to splurge for that monitor that you want so badly that might be a little bit. I don't know, nicer than this. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a good one. My, my one little gripe is there's sort of a, it almost looks like a, I don't know, a cartoon character type thing. And this is burned into the bottom <laughs> of the bezel here. Have logo. It's so cute. Yeah, it's okay, I guess. I guess I'm a, a little bit of a purist. Um, it looks like a little sticker. <laughs> and I wanted to get rid of it, and you can't. I thought it was a button when we first saw the monitor. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't actually do anything, but there it is. But that's a very minimal gripe. Um, other, otherwise, view Sonic. Again, that model number is, and I can't, I can't, how, how could you possibly remember it? VX2370S, little m, little h, L E D. All right, I think we've come great. to the thank end. You, Sarah. Thank you so much. <laughs> the end of my stop me while I'm still ahead. Uh, we've come to the end of our show, haven't we? Yes, we have, sadly. I have a bunch of other stuff in our office that yeah, we could review. <laughs> you do. That's the that's the great thing about having you around now is that it's like, ooh, what toys does Shannon have in her it's in like her Christmas. office? <laughs> it's true. And every once in a while, she sends out emails like, "New Christmas shipments. Who wants them?" And then it's like, "I want it. I want it. I want it." Yep. So, so true. So yeah, over the next week, uh, a lot more reviews being conducted. And who's your uh, who's your guest host while Leo's gone next week? Uh, next week will be Tom Merritt. Awesome. Very exciting. Yay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Of course, you can uh, you can catch up on old episodes at twit.tv slash BYB. Uh, you can uh, email any suggestions or reviews or what have you to before you buy at twit.tv. Uh, for Leo Laporte, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks everybody for joining us on this episode. I will see you next week.